Welcome everybody to our November book talk, Buried Beneath the City, an Archaeological History of New York. Um, I'm Carol Willis. I'm the uh, founder and director of the Skyscraper Museum, as most of you who are on this call know. Uh, we're um, here tonight with two of the authors of um, this wonderful book about the archaeology, uh, archaeological investigations of New York um, that you see here, uh, which, which has five authors. I'll name um, our speakers for tonight, Nan Rothschild and Amanda Sutphin, uh, and as well as their co-authors naming now Arthur Bankoff and Jessica um, Stribel McLean. Uh, authors of a kind of compendium, uh, a primer on uh, as you can see, a very beautiful book in terms of its illustrations, and some of them are going to be shown to you uh, tonight um, with the PowerPoint that Nan and Amanda will go back and forth in order to explain their um, experience in digging in New York, their um, responsibilities as teachers and as the head of the um, archaeological um, division um, within the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Amanda will um, describe to us how our uh, taxpayers' dollars are put to good work thinking about what's, what's underneath the city and make, making sure we preserve that history. Uh, let me give a very brief um, bio or, or sketch of our um, speakers tonight, uh, but I want to leave plenty of time after their presentations that we'll sample from the, from the book uh, in order to to uh, allow the audience to pose questions to the speakers. And I suggest that in order to do that, you use the chat function, um, which you address to only one voice, which is the Skyscraper Museum. And those will be collected so that I'll be able to, to then um, uh, moderate a kind of uh, general discussion. So please do pose questions. I know we're um, all looking forward to seeing what interests the um, our, our audience has, uh, but I asked both Nan and Amanda to kind of lay out the landscape that is described um, in this book, uh, but also because, well, at least I'm here downtown, Lower Manhattan, the Skyscraper Museum, uh, to talk a, a little bit more of a focus on, on downtown, um, which is, of course, uh, where the colonial city begins. Um, there are layers of history even before that. And where um, Nan has, was, uh, was digging uh, and where um, much of Landmark's uh, Preservation Commission's focus has been in, uh, in saving the, uh, the, the remains of New Amsterdam, the findings during the excavations of the digging of foundations of skyscrapers. All of these are part of unearthing um, the story um, of New York. And so um, let me just briefly mention that uh, Nan Rothschild is now a professor emeritus. Um, I believe she's still doing some teaching, but from um, Columbia and Barnard. Uh, where she uh, was, she, well, she is an urban social archaeologist, and she she was the Anne Whitney Olin Professor of Anthropology at Barnard College, um, and uh, there she published many books on New York and on urban archaeology, including Colonial Encounters in the Native American Landscape, um, New York City Neighborhoods, the 18th century, uh, and the archaeology of American cities, which she co-authored in, in 2016, in which she gave a talk um, at, at the Skyscraper Museum physical space um, back in the day. And Amanda Sut Sutton is the um, head of the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission Archaeological Repository. So um, let me go off the screen and um, allow, I guess, Amanda to share her screen and we'll have a kind of back and forth exposition of um, the history. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction. I'm going to talk a little bit about the, uh, about our book and about this presentation. And then Amanda and I will take turns um, going back and forth talking about slides. Um, our book represents an archeological perspective on the history of New York City, but it's based on the work of many archeologists who have been doing field work in the city for the last 40 years. It's quite appropriate that we discuss this book at, at the Skyscraper Museum uh, because of its location in Lower Manhattan, where the largest proportion of uh, New York City's 
population lived during the 17th, 18th, and much of the 19th century. The museum itself was built at a later time on landfill rather than on the fast land of some of the original town. Many of the artifacts in the collections, as well as in the book, come from Manhattan uh, and the historical period. A lot of development took place in New York City in the 1980s, um, and this has contributed an unintended bias to the repository's collections. We do have collections from the other boroughs, and we have some from city agencies other than landmarks. Um, indigenous material uh, from before European arrival is mostly from the less developed areas of the city, such as Staten Island uh, and the Bronx. The book is organized chronologically, but it's also focused on artifacts that are in the repository. So it is not a complete history of New York. It, it looks at topics stimulated by the excavations and their findings. What we'll discuss tonight is only a small sample of what's in the book, an even smaller sample of what's in, held in the repository. We encourage you to read the whole book um, and look at the repository's website. It highlights artifacts kept there, which are the responsibility of the city of New York. Amanda? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Carol, and thank you, Nan. And I just wanted to thank you for inviting us to share highlights from the book. And we're going to be providing an introduction about who we are, what urban archaeology is, and how it's usually done in New York City and what it can tell us about the past. And I just wanted to add to what Nan said to note that we wrote the book to share our knowledge about the lives of the people who've lived in New York City, which have been written into the city's artifacts from every period of its history. And we very much hope our book helps you hear their stories. These photos are of Penn Station before and after it was demolished in 1963. It was one of the seminal events that galvanized the creation of LPC. The Landmarks Preservation Commission is the mayoral agency responsible for protecting and preserving New York City's architecturally, historically, and culturally significant buildings and sites. It designates buildings and sites as landmarks and then regulates changes made to them. LPC is an independent expert agency comprised of a panel of 11 commissioners representing each borough and various professions, including at least three architects, one historian, one city planner or landscape architect, and one realtor. The commission supported by the agency's staff that includes preservationists, researchers, architects, historians, attorneys, administrative employees, and of course, archeologists. The book highlights stories from the archeological repository, as Nan noted, which was created and is managed by Landmarks Preservation Commission. The mission of the repository is to curate the city's significant archeological collections in one central location and to make them accessible by appointment to scholars and university classes, as is shown here, and to everyone through the website, which is nyc.gov archeology span Archeology span has taken place in what is now New York City since the 19th century. However, while many archaeologists lived in New York City in the late 19th and early 20th century, most focused their interests on other parts of the world, such as Egypt. And so the work that happened in the city was generally done by avocational archaeologists, then that is people who did not earn their living from archaeology, but including Stanley Wisniewski, pictured here, excavating at the Graham Court site, which is in College Point, Queens. These men largely focused on documenting indigenous people sites and areas related to the Revolutionary War. The work was essential as many of the sites were subsequently developed and would be completely unknown without their efforts. But it should be noted that they did not always employ the methodologies or ethics that today's professionals would. Urban archeology span is the study of cities. It's the archeology span of the city, not just archeology span in the city. It uses the material culture that is the things that have been left behind to show what life was like in New York of the past. This is an image of archeologists standing on a late 18th century sloop that was found at the World Trade Center site in 2010. And the outline is there. The ship was sunk to extend the Western shoreline of Manhattan. And after its discovery, it was removed by the archeolog archeological team and will be exhibited at the New York State Museum. This photo shows the seven Hanover Square block in the foreground and the Stadhuis in the back. Both were seminal projects that discovered that significant archeological resources are present even in densely developed parts of New York City. 
The Stadhuis block excavations targeted the area where the Dutch town hall was located and Seven Hanover Square was where the waterfront was expanded into the East River through making land. Both projects uncovered very significant colonial artifacts and artifacts are defined as objects used by people in their daily lives that are now curated by the repository and a few of which will be mentioned tonight. As Nan mentioned, the archeology span in the book derives from 40 years of field work done by many professional archeologists in the city. And the first and most common way archeology span happens is through the environmental review process. There are federal, state, and local laws that ensure that government agencies consider the potential impacts of proposed projects on a range of issues, including archeology. span LPC assists other agencies by reviewing their proposed projects. And if there may be an impact, oversees the ensuing work. The second way archaeology usually happens is through the landmarks law for sites where the LPC regulates proposed subsurface work, such as at Akawakang Manahanang Island Protected from the Wind archaeological site, which was designated an individual landmark in 2021. It's in Conference House Park, which is in Staten Island, and it was occupied sporadically for millennia by indigenous peoples. Archaeology is completed in sequential phases, although not, not all projects necessarily go through each step. But initially, a documentary survey is done, which is a fine-grained history of a specific location. Then testing occurs to see what's actually in the ground. And then either archaeological excavation occurs if something significant is found, or project redesign, which protects significant resources in place. And it requires many people to complete and is considered therefore a team sport by archeologists. Archeology span has helped trace the life ways of indigenous peoples who lived in the area for thousands of years. One of the oldest sites on the East Coast was found in Staten Island where uh, spear points that are at least 14,000 years old used to hunt mastodon were recovered. Um, this slide shows some of the indigenous artifacts created in the repository and are described in the book. They include stone tools from different periods uh, of use that were used for hunting and processing food. And in the upper right-hand corner, some ceramics used for food storage and cooking. These were mostly found uh, in the Bronx, Staten Island, and Queens. Some of these artifacts, such as the ceramics and points, help us date the context they were found within. Uh, if you think about the difference between a 1950s car and a modern car, you can think about how styles of artifacts change. Um, however, there are some tools, such as the one in the lower left, uh, whose shape does not change greatly over time, and so was not useful for data. Historical archaeology in New York is defined as the study of the period between European arrival uh, until the end of the 19th century. It uses multiple documents such as this map, as well as archeological sites and artifacts. This map shows what Dutch New Amsterdam was like in 1660 uh, when the settlement existed on the lower, the Southern tip of the island. Note the palisade along what is now Wall Street and the canal where Broad Street, I'm not finished, okay, uh, where Broad Street is now located in the red arrows. The palisade was meant to protect the settlers against invasions, real or imagined, by indigenous peoples and the British. The Dutch colonial period was pretty short. It ended in 1664 and left a limited sample of archeological materials, including artifacts such as these. The object on the left is a cook pot. Uh, this, the word is the same in Dutch and was found during the seven Hanover Square excavations. It was a three-legged vessels that would typically have been used first for cooking and then for serving food. It was set into the coals and then it would be brought to the table. Uh, this particular one was likely broken before it was ever used as there are no scorch marks on it. The decorative tile on the right shows a biblical scene and it depicts a religious figure. We think it's either St. Jerome or a prophet being attacked by a lion. These tiles were used as fireplace surrounds or in interiors. They were very typical Dutch decorations uh, and these were used to facilitate piety. Um, this one was found, the tile was found in Battery Park in Lower Manhattan. These are two 18th century artifacts. The one on the left is a sugar mold. 
was found in Whitehall Street in Lower Manhattan and led archeologists to research New York City's role in the sugar trade. Sugar cane was grown in the Caribbean by enslaved workers and brought to New York for processing. At that time, raw sugar would be boiled, cooled in molds like this one, uh, and the molasses would be processed, uh, would be removed so that the sugar would whiten. Uh, the byproduct molasses would be sold separately. At the beginning of the American Revolution, there were five refineries uh, south of Chamber Street, and by 1860, there were 14. These produced up to half of the nation's sugar and dominated New York's, uh, dominated U.S. sugar production until the early 20th century. The artifact on the right is a punch bowl, uh, most likely used for rum or brandy drinks, and these were both byproducts of sugar production. They were very common drinks in the colonial era and into the early 19th century. Material culture is essential in filling in gaps in documentary history, which for example, say, say little about uh, the lives of black people in early New York City. The excavation of the African burial ground, again, there's a red arrow, it's called the Negro's burial ground, um, is shown in the 1755 map and it yielded more than 400 burials, which were analyzed to reveal some of the physical stresses from hard labor that people worked, lived, lived and worked with, and the conditions of the children born in New York, many of whom did not survive infancy. A DNA analysis showed the African origin of adults. The artifacts on the left are shroud pins, which were found in City Hall Park, shown in the commons uh, in the map above. Uh, the dead were covered in cloth shrouds that were pinned and then usually placed into single wooden coffins. Shroud pins were the most common burial related artifact found in the African burial ground. The sites are within the African burial ground and commons historic district and landmarks regulates any in-ground work within the district. Everything shown here derives from the workshop of Simeon Sulein, who was a Huguenot uh, 18th century silversmith. His workshop included apprentices and one enslaved person. The objects on the left are crucibles uh, used for melting silver. And his workshop made the silver tea caddy set on the right. It dates to about 1700 and it's currently part of the collections of the men. Uh, Archaeology is invaluable in documenting everyday objects like the crucibles, which can then shed light on silversmithing, whereas objects like the tea caddy are rarely found in the archeological record because they're either passed down as heirlooms or sold. New York has a long and important military history. On the left side is a portion of the 1776 Ratzer map depicting New York in 1766 to 67, showing what is today Battery Park and its surrounding streets in Lower Manhattan just south of the Skyscraper Museum. The red lines show 1755 fortifications that were archeologically documented during the South Ferry Terminal Project. And this is a good example of how historic maps are used in archeology. span In this case, they initially established the likely sensitivity of what might be at the site within the project area. And then they were used again during the analysis phase once the resources had been found. On the right are two American and British enlisted men's buttons <clears throat> that were found during the same project. And I want to note the button on the left side says USA, so it would have been a member of the Continental Army. And on the right, it says 31, so the person who wore it would have been a member of the English 31st Foot Regiment. As you know, the revolution shattered the city itself. Fires destroyed more than a third of it, and the British occupied it for most of the war. However, it did provide an opportunity for escape for enslaved people, and many people took refuge here while the British controlled it. Historian Paul Gilgey considered this period the largest slave revolt of the 18th century, and some estimates suggest that between 80,000 to 100,000 enslaved people escaped 13 colonies during this time. While archaeology often documents the small everyday objects of people's lives, it can also shed light on changing infrastructure. One of the key stories of New York City is water. In the initial colonial settlement, people relied on local water sources, but with the development of the city and growing infrastructure, the water supply was insufficient and often what existed was polluted. 
In the colonial era, public wells were built, and one was found under the Corbin Building on Broadway while the new Fulton Street Station was under construction. The Corbin Building was built in 1888 to 89 and is considered a transitional skyscraper as it was eight and a half stories tall and used cast iron beams and bearing masonry walls. In the late 18th century, the Manhattan Water Company was chartered to create a water system for Lower Manhattan. They installed hollowed out tree trunks into the street beds and building owners were charged for their use. These particular logs in front of you were found at Quinty Slip and are now in the collections of the New York Historical Society. And it should be noted that the Manhattan Water Company today is one of the many ancestors of J.P. Morgan Chase. At the beginning of the 19th century, the New York skyline would have been dominated by buildings only a few stories tall. But at the end of the century, the Park Row building at 30 stories was one of the tallest buildings in the world. Today, it is a New York City landmark. New York in the 19th century was a production center whose influence increased over time. The stoneware jar on the left was manufactured in Manhattan Wells, which was near today's Foley Square in Lower Manhattan. It was made by John Remy III, um, who came from a family of German potters. Stonewares were very essential for food storage in a time before refrigerators or Tupperware, and they stored everything from flour to pickles. The piece on the right was found in what had been the cellar of a boarding house at 263 Pearl Street in Lower Manhattan. Thomas Pomerol, who used the tri-lobed tassel, again, the red arrow, um, as his trademark, worked at Corlear's Hook on the Lower East Side. Census records from, lower, from 1800 indicate that he was a free black man and was the head of a household of seven free black people. In 1820, he left New York and went to Sierra Leone as a founding leader of a settlement sponsored by the American Colonization Society. Next, please. These painted pearlware fragments uh, are from bowls and saucers that have the same pattern. They are among 35,000 pieces of ceramic that were found in one archeological deposit recovered from the seven Hanover Square site. This British made pottery was found in what had been the backyard of two late 18th to early 19th century ceramic shops. They exhibit no use wear. Uh, they were likely thrown out as they arrived broken at the shop and which would have been a massive financial loss to the merchants. Oh, ceramics, excuse me. Ceramics are very valuable to archeology span for a couple of reasons. One is that they are abundantly used but they also break easily and then they survive in the ground for long periods of time. They can also be an important time marker as their styles change rather frequently. Like ceramics, uh, bone is often recovered in archeological deposits. This is the butchered end of a cow femur. The edge on the left is sawn. Uh, the head of the femur is unfused, indicating that the animal was young at death. The study of animal bones is called faunal analysis, and it can be very important. It can tell us dramatically how, how dramatically the environment was changing through time, what species were part of the environment, what people were eating, and how food was prepared. These are oyster shells, and they come from very large oysters that lived 20 to 30 years uh, during the 18th century. Oysters produce a growth break for every year of life. And so you can count them to determine the age of the oyster at death. Studying oyster shells can also provide important information about the environment uh, of New York City's waters. And in addition, oystering uh, provided a very important food source for lots of people during the colonial era when they were very plentiful into the 19th century. Everyone ate them. They were plentiful and cheap. Oysters were so popular that New York exported them. These stoneware jars were excavated in Lower Manhattan. They were made locally and they were used to pickle and store New York oysters, which were then shipped to places like Philadelphia, Charleston, the Caribbean, Guyana, and so on. The jars were sealed with a cork and then wax. Um, oysters were pickled with vinegar and spices 
and they were very popular in the 18th and 19th century. Uh, to date, these are the only such jars that have been found archaeologically. Seneca Village was a community of free Black people. It was established in 1825, two years before full emancipation in New York State. The community became interracial after 1840. It was located about three miles north of the densely settled area of Lower Manhattan in what is now Central Park. The, the villagers were evicted through eminent domain in 1857 or 58 to create the park. Many mid 19th century newspaper accounts describe the village as a shanty town or worse. The archeological and historical research that accompanied this 2011 excavation uh, showed that those accounts were wrong and revealed that the community was a middle-class settlement where the church was at the center of life Education was important to its black residents and the rate of home ownership was high. This image shows the excavations in what were later determined as the yards of the Webster and Phillips families. Uh, this teapot also from Seneca Village is of a pottery type called transfer printed whiteware. Tea was an important ritual in 19th century women's lives across racial and class boundaries. This beautiful artifact, and you can see it was reconstructed from many pieces, uh, was also found in the backyards of the Webster and Phillips families. Seneca Village has become rather well known today, especially to a number of black artists. These patent medicine bottles are only a few of the many kinds that once existed. The one on the left was marketed to purify the, the blood and promote the discharge of bile and was sold to people traveling to bilious climates. And I can't quite figure out what bilious climates were, but I think they were hot and humid. The one in the middle contained Dr. O'Toole's cough remedies. It was marketed as curing a wide range of illnesses, including tuberculosis for which there was no known cure. The one on the right was Ayers cherry pectoral cough medicine. And it was marketed for cough, croup, asthma, sore throats, and initially it included heroin, morphine, and alcohol. In 1898, the five boroughs were consolidated to create the city as we now know it. And that's, our book actually ends in, in 1898. But this photograph taken in 1902 shows the New York skyline, which was quite different than the skylines of earlier eras, and certainly is a precursor of the one we know today. Thank you very much for listening to a few highlights from our book. We invite you to explore it and the repository website at nyc.gov slash archaeology, which has so many more stories to share. For those that want to dig deeper, pun intentional, the LPC website, nyc.gov slash landmarks, contains the actual site reports of these excavations, as well as information about the city's designated landmarks. As we, as we hope you can see, Archaeology in New York is not static. Not only are there new excavations, but collections research at the repository reveals new information about the city's past all the time. Thank you very much. That was really a fascinating presentation. Thank you so much, um, both Nan and Amanda. Uh, I, I think it's it's clear that the the book is um, lays out the history um, in well in a in a richer way than you had the opportunity to do in in a you know, fairly short, um, uh, 30 minutes or so. Uh, but the photography of the artifacts and the way that they're laid out in the book and, and beautifully printed uh, in color, as you can see, and beautifully uh, composed in the, in the layout. Uh, um, I think, Amanda, you were going to mention that the, the publisher is Columbia University Press. And if for anyone who wants to get this um, lovely hard copy, um, I guess this is the collector's version, um, you can uh, you'll be able to get it um, in your bookstore, but from Columbia University Press, and there is a discount code that we would, um, we'll put on the website or, or, or make available. Uh, but I will also mention that it's available in paperback and um, where it's very affordable and frankly, even more so if you go to Amazon, where there is just an incredible deal where um, for under $10, $9.99, you can get a copy of the book. So I really highly recommend um, that, uh, you, uh, that, that you 
use that opportunity um, and use the opportunity now for those of you who have questions that um, would certainly be answered in the book, but um, you can pose directly to two of the authors now if you enter them into the chat. So um, as we wait for the um, large audience of over 90 people to see if they have um, particular ind individual questions, let me ask you both to just um, Tell us how, you know, the, the human interest of this. How did you get into archaeology in the first place? What, you know, what attracted your attention as a student or as a young person? Um, did you start in anthropology or art history? You know, what, what's, a what's a common trajectory? What's your trajectory? And how might um, students today pursue, you know, at Columbia Barnard um, at a degree in archaeology, and, and what would they what would they expect to um, you know uh, kind of follow um, as an academic curriculum that prepares you for uh, the unknown of you know what's what's in the dirt um, under uh, under Seven Hanover Square. I guess since I'm older, I'll start. <laughs> <laughs> when I um, was in graduate school, I was intrigued. Uh, by a professor who posed wonderful questions. And it was, at that point, there was no historical archeology. span It was only prehistoric. So I did a dissertation in prehistory. Um, but then I also had uh, young children and there were, uh, at the, the as the environmental movement began to grow, there were opportunities for um, the kind of field work where you could go home at night. And so, um, mm -hmm. That's how I got involved initially with the Stathouse block with Diana Wall under the guidance of Bert Salwin, who was our professor at NYU and who was one of the pioneers of urban archaeology. Um, I think today the field of historical archaeology has grown so much and urban archaeology is kind of a subset of that. And um, there are many routes. I, I started in anthropology, but people start in art history, in classics, in uh, in history itself. Um, and, and archaeology, I think, is really a set of techniques. And the question that you, the questions that you pose come from your, your intellectual background. And so there are many ways to get into archaeology. Amanda, do you want to yeah, so I should say Nan actually was my undergraduate advisor. So she's the one who really ignited my interest in urban archaeology. And it's really a thrill that I got to do this book with her. Um, uh, I too did, I, anthropology was uh, my way in. Um, I would certainly agree to do archaeology, though there are classical archaeologists, there are Egyptologists, there's um, uh, you know, there's different, there's uh, the people who focus more on art history, but people generally who's, who study New York City archaeology generally come through anthropology. So they're generally anthropological archaeologists who then focus on urban studies. Um, and as a profession, most archaeologists actually work in what the, the environmental review, cultural resource management um, end of the spectrum rather than in academia. And if people have more questions, if they're interested in the field, you're welcome to get in touch with me here at Landmarks. My email is asutphin, S-U-T-P-H-I-N, at lpc.nyc.gov. Well, I suppose apropos, we have we have one question from uh, Tim Hinkle, um, and apropos to Landmarks and the oversight, uh, is an archaeological review or a clearance part of the standard building plan um, to uh, for new building construction. Uh, I think we're talking about EIS and various other obligatory. I, I would say it is not standard. M most construction in the city it happens um, what's known as as of right. So it's it's working within existing zoning, and those projects do not have there's there isn't any archaeological oversight unless it happens to be a designated resource, and then we may be involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that is important to understand. Yeah. Okay. Well, as we wait for, for additional um, questions to come in, I, I have some myself um, about uh, some of the kind of re reconstructions of the early 
of early early New York, um, and especially I think um, architects and and um, landscape architects have been particularly fascinated with Eric Sanderson's study of Manhattan in a a long term. Uh, work that's been turned into a wonderful website and a book where a slider can take you from the contemporary city back to uh, the landscape that Henry Hudson would have seen when he when he um, sailed uh, into New York Harbor. So I, I guess my question, kind of quasi-academic question is, how much do you need to know from textual documents in order to inform the findings on a particular site. You showed us maps, um, but what 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 other kind of historical F reference gives you a portrait of the kind of social construction as well as the physical fabric of of New York? And then how do the, how do the artifacts then play into that? Nan, well, you start uh, with any historic project. You start before you get into the field, looking at the documentary history. And there are tax records. I mean, especially if you're in the 19th century, tax records, census records, city directories, uh, lots of maps. The maps are wonderful. But you, you use all of that to build a picture of who might have lived on the, in this space that you're hoping to excavate. Uh, I mean, some people excavate, uh, some people have been able to excavate in a backyard of a standing structure. And so they know, uh, you know, I mean, Diana Wall, for example, worked at the Merchant's House. And so she knew a lot about the people who lived there. Um, when we worked at Seneca Village, we were able to uh, get a very complete uh, account of the people who lived there uh, because they were mostly property owners. Now, if you're in an area where people don't own property, then you won't have those kinds of resources or if it's before people kept very good records. But um, I think that that's, it's, it's very, you, you cannot underrate uh, the importance of the documents. On the other hand, artifacts give you texture and artifacts address questions that the documents don't. You know, I mean, what were people eating? Uh, you know, what was the lives of, what were the lives of poor people like or, or black people? You know, you don't, the documents often ignore, or women even. I mean, there's a lot of neglected data about the lives of women. We know that Dutch women were different from British women in the sense that they were equal inheritors with their brothers of their parents' wealth. Um, and they, the women kept their own names. That comes from the history. Uh, we haven't really seen that in the documents, but um, it, it, there's a sort of an endless amount of <laughs> historic research that you can do. And then the archeological information leads you, as I, as I mentioned with the sugar uh, processing, uh, I, I didn't know, and I don't know that anybody, any of us did, uh, what, of the importance of New York City in the, in the sugar processing uh, business until we found this mold and several other molds and then started doing research on it. So sometimes an artifact leads you to research and sometimes the research leads you to artifacts. Mm -hmm. Well, sugar houses were um, part of the early, the early landscape of New York um, among the tallest buildings in the city because some they were five and six stories often. Uh, so uh, there's, there was a surprising survival even of that form into the into the 19th century. Uh, and and you know domino sugar was a you know a long long lived one but lower lower manhattan on the on the west side has a has a sugar um a, a sugar house that was uh, up uh, off west street in in tribeca i amanda i wonder you know how how does the built fabric um of of surviving buildings then um you know interface or or mesh with the archaeological record um, from Landmark's perspective, I guess? Um, I think that's a great question. I think it, it does definitely intersect. Um, I think it depends on the period, though. Obviously, the earlier you go, you know, we, we don't have standing structures from the indigenous periods. We don't, you know, the Dutch um, survivals are rather limited. Certainly, we don't have you know, we have the street grid, but we don't have standing structures in lower Manhattan. So it depends on the period. Um, but I think the archaeology and standing structures can go hand in glove. 
Um, I remember Michael Devonshire, who's now a commissioner at Landmarks, spoke about using the archaeological findings to help interpret the building to better understand, you know, when it was constructed and, you know, how it was constructed and what the, the original hardware had been. And um, so they definitely can work very well hand in glove. And uh, for those people who don't know, um, Seven Hanover Square and the Stadthuis that has um, artifacts which are visible that have been incorporated into the sidewalk within the within the public realm as a, as a memory of place. Could you maybe talk a little bit how the developers um, work together with or obli are obliged to work with um, landmarks in, in order to make visible this history? Well, it was the Stadthouse block um, that had that exhibit, and it was uh, not something that the developers wanted. It was something that Landmarks somehow uh, insisted on. And so we had this display below the surface. Um, and then after Hurricane Sandy, of course, it got flooded. Um, and I haven't seen whether it's been redeveloped, but it was. It, it was. It, so, it has been. It and it's looking pretty good now. Oh, good. But we had we found the foundations of a tavern. Not uh, we did not find the foundations of the Dutch town hall, but we found a tavern that had been used briefly as a town hall. Because when you think about it, I mean, the only large public buildings, you know, secular public buildings, would have been taverns, and so they were natural for uh, places for uh, the the town fathers to meet. Um, so we did find this, the Lovelace Tavern, um, and it survived because it had originally occupied two lots. And when the uh, building, uh, the 19th century building was built on top of it, they didn't remove the walls of the lower, of the earlier building. They just sort of leveled the ground. And so they built their 19th century building on top. And so the, the earlier walls remained intact. And we found some of the floor and we found you know, wine bottles and lots of pipes and very good stuff. Well, what what about this idea of making the visible hit, um, making visible the history? So we we have findings. How about um, public history representations in on streets on, on sites? Um, how does how does Landmarks work or how, how can Landmarks work with other organizations in order to make, you know, um, kind of persistent uh, the idea of the, the, the layers of history that, um, especially in, in lower Manhattan? Um, that's a great question. There, there have been, there certainly have been a, f a handful of projects where um, archaeology, that there has been an exhibit that's resulted. Um, there, there's one now in the, the Midtown West Riverside, which you, you can go visit. Um, so, you know, there's a whole exhibit about the archaeology that was found there. Um, you know, the other big initiative that we made is virtual. So the repository website, we do have online exhibits. We, you know, we're trying to present that information. Um, but generally that kind of big ask from developers happens during what's called the mitigation phase. So, you know, sometimes it's an exhibit, sometimes it may be, um, a public report. There's a really excellent one that the MTA did <clears throat> for the South Ferry project in lower Manhattan, where they found those walls that I had mentioned, the, the 1755 walls, and they created this really excellent, very accessible book about the history of the site and what was found. Um, with the idea that being uh, students could use it. Um, in addition, they also took a piece of that wall and it's now on display in the South Ferry station. So you can see it. It's a very, very small sign, a very small sign. So it wouldn't surprise me if many of you have walked by not realizing what it is, but it's at the foot of the escalator. So mm -hmm. sharp eyed, sharp eyed t people today may have noticed it. If you haven't, pay attention next time you go. Um, so I think though that that is something that I would like to see more of, because um, I, I think that's, and if you have ideas of how we can partner with you, Carol, that would be great. <laughs> okay, I'll think about that. Um, well, what, um, Nan, I think you did mention the African-American um, burial ground, which is a, a lower Manhattan um, mm -hmm. national um, park site, uh, which um, maybe people haven't visited and they should know more about, but that also raises the question of, controversy about 
digging, digging and finding um, human remains and even, you know, not material culture, but the, but um, spiritual cultures that mm -hmm. um, offend some, some people about um, putting them on display or even disturbing them in any way. Well, the African yeah. burial ground was a very controversial project um, and it was started. The archeologists in charge were not black. Uh, the community was, I mean, the so-called African community in New York was very diverse with many different points of view, um, but there seemed to be general agreement that they wanted the archeologists who were responsible for these human remains to be black because they thought they would be more sensitive to their cultural concerns, cultural and spiritual. Um, I don't think it was, I mean, it was a project that was uh, run by the GSA. I don't think it was their finest hour. Um, no. But, <laughs> but no. They, uh, eventually, I mean, one of the things that the African American community did was get the project halted uh, so that there were no more excavations. I mean, there are probably thousands more burials. 400 is a lot. You don't need more than 400 to say a lot. And they, um, Michael Blakey, who took over the project, did a very thorough uh, and impressive report with colleagues, um, with the DNA analysis, with the, the an analysis of uh, what kinds of injuries people had gotten because of the labor they did. I mean, some people had cervical vertebrae broken, presumably from having loads, from carrying loads or having loads, you know, placed carelessly on their heads. There were muscle attachments, you know, with repeated motions, the, the, the bones actually change as the muscles are used differently. And so a lot of that was visible in the analysis and the analysis was very thorough. Um, but I think there were a lot of people who thought that the project uh, should never have happened, should never have excavated as many sets of human remains as they did. But and now people, there, is a and just, there is a wonderful display and a museum. And so uh, if you accept the fact that it's been done and, and that whatever harm there was, there's also positive associations with it because it's, uh, there's a lot of, of very good uh, information in the museum and the uh, memorial itself is beautiful. And, and just to give a little background, the African burial ground was in use by 1712. That's the first historic record of, of the burial ground, although it may well have been earlier. And then it was in use until 1795. And um, as Anne said, hundreds, if not thousands of people were interred there. And this 1991 excavation disinterred over 400 burials, which were then subsequently reinterred after study in 2007. And I would encourage everyone to go to, to that site. So naming the location of the site very near Foley Square um, on, on Broadway, there's there. It's 290 Broadway, I'm sorry, is the address for the Interpretive Center. I apologize, yeah. yeah. Great. And then yes, just, and what you alluded to otherwise, Carol, yes, human remains are particularly sensitive and it's very important to consult with the descendant community about the appropriate treatment of the remains at each step, which is something the General Services Administration did not do for the African Burial Ground Project, which I believe is in part of why it was so controversial, um, but it is it is appropriate to, to, to consult with descendant communities about how their their ancestors should be treated they did they did consult but they but he was the person who was in charge was very dismissive and he yeah. was suggesting a plaque you know a plaque would be an adequate memorial is so that he, okay yeah yeah they had meetings he said we are required to consult with you we're not required to do what you want okay anyway i meant i meant more the the spirit of consultation rather than mm -hmm. thank you though for that <laughs> The spirit is not just, um, we still do whatever we want. Yeah. Right. Well, th yeah. thinking then of, of Seneca Village in Central Park, um, there there is no memorial there now, right? I mean, is are there are there plans to um, to, to somehow re reconstruct, re you know, imagine, commemorate uh, 
is that controversial or is it something that is just hasn't happened yet? It, there's actually signage there now, just started to jump in. There is signage there now about the history of the site. It's pretty extensive also, signage actually. Community Board 10 in Harlem is really interested in having more of a presence. Uh, there have been discussions. The Central Park Conservancy really values its park space, is not, you know, very happy to think about um, what kind of uh, any extensive memorial. We've talked about maybe a garden that had uh, plants of the day, but I don't know what's going to happen. And I think that it, it will be a very interesting thing to observe because it's obviously something that that the community wants um, and, and perhaps they will persevere. Well, uh, along those lines, um, we uh, Amanda, you did mention the Native Americans, especially in Staten Island, and the astonishing fact of the artifacts that date back 14,000 years on, on the site. Clearly, there is no textual record um, at, at that time, no, no written historical record. And um, uh, uh, Eltka et Eltka Blazer has asked, um, I think, um, with a with an air quote, I guess you used the word surely. How much do we know surely about the lives of uh, Native Americans on New York City land? Well, <laughs> it's very fragmentary. Certainly, if you go back that far, if you find some projectile points, you know they were hunting Mastodon. But you, I mean, what we need obviously is a fuller picture. And for that, you need uh, food remains, which are organic and tend to deteriorate in the ground. So we have, we have flint, we have stone tools, we have ceramics, those tend to survive. And so we can tell what kinds of tools they used, what kinds of activities, you know, they were probably undertaking, but it's such a long time period. And there are so few sites that it's it's a very fragmentary picture. I mean, we can extrapolate from other similar uh, Colombian communities from adjacent areas, but we have uh, very little material in, in New York City itself. Amanda, do you want to add to that? No, I think you answered, answered that well. And uh, uh, Dennis has asked, are, um, are there any differences between the excavations in a city as opposed to a more open area? Does the process change because of the buildings and who owns the property? I think we've addressed this somewhat, but um, you know, one, one thinks um, in, in, in art history, uh, the archaeology department is usually about civilizations of the past. The evidence is entirely urban evidence. Um, now, Nan, as you've described, the kind of dimensions where scientific analysis can be brought to bear about climate and, and um, diet and, uh, and other issues has, you know, has, has introduced new dimensions into reconstructing the past. But um, do, you want to, do you want to talk about maybe within the Native American versus the New Amsterdam context, you know, how, how certain can we be, you know, what, what can we divine from, uh, from the different sorts of records? Well, one of the things that I would note is that in, you know, when we excavated Seneca Village, the stratigraphy, which is the, the layers that exist, were, were really simple. The existence of the village appeared within six inches of the ground surface. This was a part of the park that hadn't been heavily filled, so it just happened that way. When we dug in lower Manhattan, the stratigraphy was a mess. I mean, you, you know, you had layers cutting into each other and it was very hard. It was very hard to figure out what was going on until we really got sort of a handle on uh, what it was like and how how many lenses there were and how many different kinds of materials would be in one, um, you know, one small test unit that was uh, maybe four feet deep and a, a meter by a meter. Um, so, I mean, it's it that kind of difference is really significant for archaeological practice. Uh, 
And there are obviously lots of other differences too. Sorry. I would say the other key difference between rural and urban here is just the access to the site and the logistics. So mm -hmm. particularly digging in lower Manhattan, um, getting machinery into a site, getting access to a site. If it's a street bed needing to shut things down, um, you have a much more limited window of access to the site. Um, you have to be very concerned about site security and could someone get in and trip and fall in a way I don't think you need to in a more rural area. Mm -hmm. And those logistics look tough. And the other thing I just want to mention is many people may see archaeology happening and not realize it, it is because archaeologists dress like construction workers. You know, they have a hard hat, the safety vest, all the other safety provisions that must be taken. Um, so I, I do want to note that many people probably do see archaeology and just think it's some engineer or something happening. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, um, unfortunately, just to, as it turns seven o'clock, there's some additional pointed questions um, in the chat, and maybe we can send those to you after and see if you if you have any um, particular res responses. Um, but um, early on, the question was, um, what what's your what was what's the the favorite site that you would want to explore, um, and you know what what's I suppose your most exciting discovery. So maybe you could both um, take a greatest hit and a greatest uh, wish, genie wish out of as a last comment. Well, I mean, there's a site that's being excavated now or is about to be excavated. Um, Amanda knows about it, um, which <laughs> was once a warehouse uh, during the colonial period. Um, and I, I'm very excited to hear about that. But I, I think from my Point of view. I mean, it's hard to say a favorite site, but uh, the earliest exciting find that we had was the Lovelace Tavern um, because it was, you know, below street grade, below several levels down, and and there it was. It had straw matting on the floor, and we found eggshells, and um, you know, this uh, uh, a, a container. Uh, a barrel that held a lot of wine bottles. It was a very, it really resonated. You know, you could feel what the tavern might have been like, what people would have done in the tavern. And the artifacts were different than those in a rural tavern. So it was an it was an urban place. People stopped in to have a drink and to chat and gossip and um, but they didn't stay overnight as they do in rural towns. So that was my favorite. Nan. Um, I think we'll just have time to cite that Nan was referring to, which I'm very excited about as well, is 250 Water Street, which is in the South Street Seaport Historic District. It's uh, the field work is paused now, but I can't wait until they come back. Uh, there's potential for 17th century Allerton Warehouse and Shipyard and maybe in 18th century resources as well. So stay tuned. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, well, that that is an exciting prospect, and it puts together um, the um, some of the questions posed about the responsibility of the developer on the, on the site. So, um, the regulation, um, whether it's EIS or Land, landmarks protection, is the way in um, to uh, for archaeologists to uh, to you know ha have gain a gain a foothold. Um, on these sites and to live up to the responsibility um, that we have to take care of the land and what's under the land. So, um, so thank you for, uh, for explaining Landmark's role, Amanda, tonight. And thanks, Nan, for inspiring Amanda to go into her field uh, <laughs> oh, these many years ago. So um, you get you get full credit of um, of uh, toiling in the in the fields and on the in in the digs for the the longest and most influential time. And we thank you for all of the work that you've done in these years and help to to shape this um, discipline and our knowledge about uh, about buried beneath New York. So um, I highly recommend that people go and find the book and especially the um, the at the bargain price at Amazon. Um, they'll fly off the shelves, I'm sure. So um, I'm really pleased that you could both be with us tonight and um, I invite our regulars to come back uh, at the end of this month when Rick McGahey will talk about unequal cities um, and we will have a, a, an economist give us a, a framework for understanding 
the both the past, present, and um, perhaps even the future of American cities. So we like to to spread our interests as wide as possible. Um, and we like to focus in the way that you, you do do your attention um, into a site and into history and into documents. So thank you for being with us, um, both Nan and Amanda tonight and everybody else. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.